All right, thank you for joining everybody. Um, we're going to talk this week about running this race well. This is a very, very, very important and transformational topic. And the more I just, God put it on my heart to look into it this week and, and to speak on it, but the more I just dove back into this this whole doctrine, this whole idea, it was really, really, really encouraging. Just It speaks of God's goodness and his heart for his people. Um, I'm going to begin with this. Ephesians 4, verses 17 and 22 to 24, it says, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. So don't walk as the way that the world goes, and put off concerning the former conversation the old man. So put away the things that you used to do and the way you used to be, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, the new nature that Christ created for us, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And Hebrews 12, 1 continues, it says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So anything that holds you back, puts you down, or derails you, or slows you, put it away. And let us run with patience, with endurance, the race that is set before us. Okay, this is not just about enduring this life and trying to get through and we're obligated to do things for God. It's not about that. Jesus wants to transform us. He is our, we're his hands and feet. I said this last week. We're his hands and feet on the earth. And he wants to live through us. God loves partnering with his people. He could do things by himself. And there are times where he does. But he oftentimes, so often, wants to work with us and through us. And just like he created angels. He doesn't need angels. But he wants to work with others, right? So um, he wants to work with his people. He wants to work through us to evangelize the world. He wants to work through us to help build and edify the body of Christ. And yes, Jesus will minister directly to people or or. Some people that Jesus shows up in a dream and, and, and shares the gospel with them and they become Christians and no one's ever evangelized them. So there are times where God will act independently, but so often he wants to work with his children. He wants to, to build us up and to teach us and to grow us and to live with us, in us and through us. And that's just his heart, the heart of the Father for us. Um, but knowing that, it says um, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, run that ye may obtain. We're going to obtain something. We're going to obtain a reward for all the things we've done in this life for Christ. And you have to do it in faith and humility and with sincerity um, and, and not out of selfishness or, or greed or anything, but knowing that God has a reward above and beyond salvation, not just that our sins are forgiven and we're going to spend eternity with him in the new heaven, new earth. It's even more than that. It's in more than what he can do for us in this life. It's that we're, we're actually going to receive a reward when we stand before him one day. And it says in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, Paul's talking about how he laid a foundation. The foundation is Christ, and no one else can build upon, um, sorry, lay another foundation. But what we build upon it is crucial. And he says, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12 to 15, he says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So everything we do is going to get put through a fire to test it. If any man's work abides, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward, right? So gold, uh, sorry, gold, silver, and precious stones, they don't get consumed by fire, they actually get purified by it. And if you built out, if you if you built on the foundation of Christ these good things, and you pursued him, and you gave your life to him in the ministry he's called, because we all have calling, and you pursued these things and, and sincerely with a good heart and in faith, giving your life to God and done these things for God, you're going to receive a reward. It will go through the fire, get purified, and you're not just going to have your work survive, but you're going to receive a reward. It says right there very clearly, verse 14, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, though, it says, if any man's work shall be burned, if you built with wood, hay, or stubble, um, he shall suffer loss. It doesn't say that you're going to be tortured or beaten or condemned or die. or It doesn't say any of that. It just says you suffer loss. All your work was for nothing because you didn't do things for God or at least not from the right heart. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you will, you will be saved. It's not about salvation, but it, it, it is... Um, it, it's going to be disappointing. It's like, it's like when you graduate high school. I've heard this analogy before that when you graduate high school and, and you're like, oh, I'm so happy I made it through. Now I can move on with my life and next stages and this and that. But then you also look back and regret a little bit like, oh, I, I wish I had tried harder. I know I could have got better marks. I could have done this or this differently. And you, you, you do have a little bit of regret sometimes. 
um, but but you're also ecstatic that you graduated and that's done, you know. So I think when we when we get to heaven one day, well, either the rapture or we die and we stand before Jesus, either way, um, we're going to be ecstatic to be there. No eye has seen, ear heard, or neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And we also know that God can do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine. So God has things planned that are beyond our comprehension. We can't ima- We can't even imagine it. And we're going to be so happy to be there to know we made it. But there might also, I think, be some regret when we put everything through the fire and we realize I should have, I could have done more for God, more for Christ. I could have shared Jesus more. I could have lived him and shone the light brighter. I could have done, I tried harder in the calling and the ministry he gave me or even pursued it at all. Um, and I think there will be some regret in that sense, but still happy that we made it. But I want to encourage you not to be in that boat where you have regret, to, to live a life in a way that you know that when you stand before God, that work is going to come through pure and it's going to, it's going to, it's going to yield a reward. Um, Paul talks about crowns, a, a number, I think five times, if I'm correct, um, five, uh, at least five times, I believe, in the New Testament, Paul talks about different crowns, crown of righteousness, crown of life, and so on. Um, and whether it's a literal crown or some kind of reward, I don't know. But we're all going to receive rewards for the things we've done for Christ. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, now I'm going to get into this here because this is an important, you're probably going to come across this verse if you haven't already. And it sounds very harsh, but I'm going to break it down for you in a way that's very encouraging. It says, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the word judgment seat in Greek is bema. You may have heard the bema seat of Christ or the bema judgment seat of Christ. And bema is a Greek word that goes back to the Isthmian games. I have a hard time saying that name. Um, Isthmian games. And whenever athletes competed and they did really well, they would go onto this platform called a bema to receive a prize, to get a reward. You didn't go up there to get thrashed or to, to get whipped or beaten or killed. or anything. It wasn't like that at all. It was just you go up there and you receive a reward for what you did. And we must all appear before the judgment, the bema seat of Christ, the the, the platform that, that we're going to receive from Christ. He's not talking about judgment. Now, the word bema in later use became known for a place where sentences were issued. But we know from Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation, none at all, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if there's no condemnation, then we're not going up there to get condemned or to get blasted for, for stuff. We're going up there to receive a reward. And Paul talks a lot about um, running the race well and shadow boxing and different things that he talks about. He, he used athletics a lot um, to, to get the message across that we're competing in, in a sense, like we're, we're, we're going for a goal. It's a, it's a better way to say it. We're, we're aiming and striving for a goal to do as much as we can for Christ, just out of love and gratitude and thankfulness to him um, and knowing that there's a reward at the end of this there's a reward and if you understand that if you really get that revelation not just in your head but in your heart um, it's a great great motivator like I didn't understand that when per- people first said that but it's the more you study this and you get into it and you understand God's heart and his goodness in this it's actually a massive motivator it's the goodness of God that calls men to repentance and when you understand his goodness that he's giving us so much that we don't even deserve it just motivates you to repent and to give your heart back to God and to and to and to to live for Him. Um, so we must all stand before the bema seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in His body according that He hath done. So it's like First Corinthians three: everything we do is going to be put through the fire, and we're going to receive a reward or not. And it says whether it be good or bad. Now, when you see that, you're going to, oh, I get a reward for doing bad. It's like, it's like a punishment for sin. That's an automatic assumption that comes into most people's minds. Um, the word for bad that was used there, if you use a strong concordance, is the, the Greek word kakos, which means um, intrinsically worthless. So, and it's a few other ways you can interpret that word, but you're going to receive a, a reward for what you've done, whether good or worthless. If you did things for Christ, great. If you didn't, it's worthless and you suffer loss, like it says in 1 Corinthians 3.15. Um, and suffering loss doesn't mean that you're being afflicted and, and, and punished and belittled and berated. It just means that you, you lost like, oh, like that was a waste of my life. I, I, <laughs> how many days, years, months, whatever that you've wasted all those opportunities missed or wasted and squandered, um, and that I could have been doing something and it's that you suffer the loss, but you, you're still saved. You're not losing your salvation over this. Um, Yeah. But there's no condemnation. Remember that in John 3.18, Jesus says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. 
John 5, 24, he who believes on him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. Right in line with Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So please don't think that you're going to be condemned by Jesus in heaven. He's not going to be up there like, oh, why did you do this or that? You have to give me an answer. He's not going to do that. He bore everything that we deserve, to pun the punishment that we do deserve. He bore it on the cross. If you understand that what he went through for us, it it it, it it humbles you and it gives you so much more gratitude for God and you want to live for him. Even if you don't get any rewards, you want to live for him if you really get that. Um, but knowing that there is a reward on top of that, that just speaks to God's goodness in his heart for us as his people. Um, my notes are crazy today. They're like literally just like they're sideways and all over. I, I, I don't know what I was doing when I wrote this. So I'm trying to remember everything I wrote. Um, yeah, everything we do, whether big or little, um, it, it all has potential for reward. There's consequences for everything. There's potential for reward. So run this race well, guys, in a way that you will receive a reward. Don't don't slack off. Don't get slowed down. If you're running a race, think about this. If you're an athlete running a race, are you going to wear a heavy backpack? No. Are you going to wear hot, heavy clothes that make you sweat? No. You're going to wear the lightest, easy to breathe clothes you can and no extra weight. You want to be as, as light as possible so you can run as fast and as long as you can. And and we're called to do that. Like it said in um, Hebrews 12, 1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run the ra and run with patience the race that is set before us. Run with endurance. No, this isn't a sprint. You're not trying to get there as fast as you can, but you run with patience. You pace yourself and you do the best you can to go all the way, to go the distance, to receive that reward that Christ has for us. And like it said at uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, run that ye may obtain. Run that ye may obtain, knowing that there's a reward for us from Jesus. And to take it seriously, don't be flippant about it. Like, oh, I'm going to get this and that. Just like be serious. No, I, I could suffer loss. I could see everything that I live my in this life for during my time I was a Christian. All that could be burned up and I end up with nothing other than my salvation. That is possible. So be take this seriously. And don't just say, oh, that's good enough. Like, on a basic level, that's good enough. But knowing that you could achieve so much more that Christ is going to reward his people for what they've done, that's a massive encouragement and a motivator, I think. Um, and one last thought is that it says in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And there's a number of verses that talk about ruling and reigning with Christ. And he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years. And in, I think it's Revelation 2, um, towards the end, it says that to him who overcomes, he will he will give to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And we're going to rule and reign with Christ, guys. For a thousand years, we get to rule and reign with him. Jesus says, if you're faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with more. He that is faithful with least is faithful with much. And and there, there's that, that principle that if we're faithful for God in this life, with the resources, the opportunities, the calling, the time we have, everything, if we're faithful to Christ, that there is a reward and he will give us more authority and more responsibility. In Luke 19, Jesus, I'm not going to read it, but Jesus gives a parable about um, like a ruler or a master that, that went on a trip and he divided his wealth among his servants. And he divided the wealth based on what they can handle. God doesn't give you more than you can, than you can, than you, than you're capable of. And if it does feel like <laughs> a reminder, guys, if it does feel like God is giving you more than you can handle, then you're either not doing what he called you to or you're doing it out of your own effort and your own strength. And most often it's your own effort and your own strength. You're not called to do this by yourself. You're called to, to rest in his strength and his power. He is our strength. And um, and yeah, so anyways, in that parable in Luke 19, um, one servant was given 10 bags of gold, for example, and he invested that money while his master was gone and he made 10 more. So he doubled the, the, the principle that he was given. And when he came, when the master came back, he was so happy. He said, well done, great job. Because you've been faithful in this, I will give you authority over 10 cities. So you see, he was faithful with, with say, a small thing with, these, with this gold. And now he's been given a greater responsibility, but it's also a privilege. It's, it's, it's an honor. It's a privilege to have that authority. And knowing that we are going to rule and reign with Christ one day for a thousand years, I think it makes perfect sense that the more faithful we are with the little things, so to speak, now, that we'll be given greater greater reward and responsibility and honor in the in the in the in the millennial reign of Christ. So I want to encourage you guys, don't forget this. Understand that there is reward and that everything we do in this life has a consequence and the potential for reward. 
And if you understand that and, and God's heart and his goodness towards his people, it just makes you want to keep on living for him. So I hope this was an encouragement to you guys. I hope that you will run this race well. It's easy to forget and get distracted. We have to be diligent. You have to have discipline, just like in a race with athletes. You have to have discipline. If you want to be successful in anything you pursue, specifically in athletics in this case, you have to have discipline in training. And it's the same thing in the spirit. You have to be disciplined. Make sure you get that time with God. Don't let structure replace your relationship, but your relationship does need structure in order for it to thrive and to get the most out of it. And you have to have discipline and having that balance with so many things in life require balance and learning that balance is the challenge. The easy thing is to take an extreme. The right way is to find that balance of relationship and structure to keep you in the race, to keep spending time with God every day um, and, and and building your spirit and, and, and your relationship with him and letting him transform you and prune you and sharpen you and make you wiser and potter you and all that. It, you need that discipline, guys. So... Um, I want to encourage you just so that we don't stand before Jesus one day and, and, and realize that we suffered loss for all the stuff, all the time that we wasted here. Um, and don't sit and lament over all the stuff that, you, that you've missed. Paul says he, he, he focuses all his energy on forgetting the past and pressing forward to what's ahead. Don't sit around looking at the past unless you're going to learn from it. But even then, don't take too much time there. Press forward, press forward, press forward, press into Christ. Everything you need is in Jesus. It's not in your past. If God wants you to look at your past for a reason, he'll let you know. But and I feel like that's important, guys, just that look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one that we're, that we're, that we're, we're, we're pursuing and that we're becoming like in, our, in our, our sanctification in this life. So press into Jesus. He is all you need. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Everything you need is in him and 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 the holy spirit's within us we have what we have what we need we can do this so i hope this was an encouragement to you guys um run this race well that you may obtain please um god thank you for this time that we had i pray this was an encouragement i pray that our hearts and our eyes are open god and that we remember to stay focused that we're running a race for you thank you so much that you have reward for your people god that we, do, we don't deserve any of this god it's just part of your grace um, just so far beyond what we can imagine or deserve. But thank you so much for it. And I pray that we will all run well the race before us, God, that we may receive the prize you have for us. And thank you so much that that is your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So I hope this helped you guys. I hope it encouraged you. And um, thank you for watching. Have a great day.